Let's get started here before the break. Uh, we're going to talk about the next 15 minutes on CMR for heart failure. And this could be a talk on the whole symposium on its own. So it's just going to be some glimpses. You have seen this prior slide and to show that the applications that cardiac MRI um, is uh, being done in Europe predominantly for the evaluation of cardiomyopathy here, about 32%, as well as in patients with myocardial dysfunction secondary to coronary artery disease for the assessment of viability. And the implications of findings on the cardiac MRI that would translate into changes in medications and therapies. One of the principal uh, findings that we can utilize, obviously, in the evaluation of patients with uh, ischemic heart disease and coronary artery disease that would have concomitant heart failure is the presence of myocardial scarring, not only for the diagnosis and assessment of viability, but as I will show it to you, some nice new emerging data on better device selection, patient selection for medical devices based on this phenotype. So one of the fundamental principles that we touched base briefly this morning was on the use of gadolinium as a paramagnetic agent to really decrease and shorten this TI time. After we inject gadolinium, that is going to increase the TI signal. We use an inversion pulse. We're going to make the normal myocardium dark, black, null. And whenever there is increase of myocardial cell death, interstitial a space expansion, gadolinium is going to sit and stay there, and by, because it has a very high relaxivity, is going to increase its signal. As I mentioned before, there are sequences to improve the detection of subendocardial scar, but this is typically done within 10 minutes or so. This is, I think, a very important landmark study, actually an epidemiological study that was ran uh, by Eric Shelbert, uh, who directs the cardiac MR at Pittsburgh. At the time, he was at the NIH looking at this Iceland uh, study. So 936 participants that got recruited from uh, 2004 to 2007, they were asked the question, sir or ma'am, do you remember having had a heart attack? And they would say yes or no, and they would answer some other uh, questions, answer about their diabetes status. And as you can see, the clinically recognized infarct was about 10% in overall population. But then when they looked into their EKGs and looking at their CMR with gadolinium, they saw that this was actually double more than that. So obviously, the more you see, the more you're going to diagnose and hopefully treat. Patients with diabetes particularly, they were you know, thought to have 11%, actually 25% were found to have unrecognized myocardial infarction, much more than those without diabetes. And when we look at the medications that they were taking, statins were much less often prescribed and had been prescribed in these patients because of the failure to recognize that almost twice. And the importance of finding this unrecognized myocardial infarction is that whether this was known or unknown, but then revealed, was exactly the same prognostically. So patients that had either unrecognized or recognized myocardial infarction had a worse mortality compared to patients without no myocardial infarction. So once the scar is there, that stratifies them to a different prognosis. Let's take you through a case uh, that happened to us a couple of years ago, 75-year-old male with a New York class three symptoms, exertional angina and dyspnea for the last three weeks. He came in with cardiogenic shock, pulmonary edema, VT, cardioversion, and you can see he was shocky, low blood pressure, tachycardic, with a troponin of only five. He's taken to the cath lab, and as you can see, very bad anatomy, has a very proximal <clears throat> LAD, chronic total occlusion, some distal uh, left main. He has occlusions as well of his OM, as well as his mid-RCA. His ejection fracture is 25%, of global hypokinesis, a little bit of mitral regurg, and he was diuresis and optimized, had balloon pump placed, was in the ICU for a couple of days, and then after this quasi storm, he's then sent to uh, the cardiac MRI to evaluate for myocardial variability for before this high risk revascularization. So on the cardiac MRI, <clears throat> as I was showing this next set of images here, we can see that, you know, similar to the echocardiography, the ejection fraction is reduced. There is definitely wall motion abnormality involving the LED distribution here, anterior, anterior, apical, all the way wrapping around. The apex is this nearly akinetic, and also interoceptum, infralateral uh, wall, so multivessel. But when we look at the gadolinium, which is going to be the arbitrator, of the viability question here, we'll see that actually 
except for the apical cap, which becomes obviously thin, there's actually preserved viability for this patient, and therefore, despite this wall motion abnormality, he should benefit from revascularization. So this was um, reproduced, again, on the short axis, as you can see uh, these other images. So this patient then moved forward. He had a three-vessel uh, bypass surgery, and the CMR was repeated within one month when he returned for follow-up. His ejection fraction had already improved, and you can see the contractility and wall thickness also had improved. So stating that perhaps myocardial hibernation on the top of a small myocardial infarction that he had sustained in the LV apex, but nonetheless a saving uh, you know, procedure, and obviously uh, for this patient. Why is uh, this important? This has been shown um, previously in animal studies, but also in clinical studies that I have shown next. The capability of CMR, given its spatial resolution, 20 times better than SPECT, to be able to recognize this small subadenocardial infarcts. And depending on the transmurality of the infarct extent, that is going to be a determinant of the recovery of function, as I shown this slide early on this morning. Some examples that one can see in ischemic heart disease, a transmural infarct, no LAD viability, pretty much dead muscle, subadenocardial infarct with some viability in the mid septum, this patient with large transmural and apical clot, and also other complications that can come with myocardial infarction, like this basal uh, pseudoaneurysm. This patient actually presented with uh, abdominal pain. Um, and it was actually an expansion of this um, you know, large pseudoaneurysm compressing her um, stomach and diaphragm. So new uh, interesting area that also CMR can be helpful is in a proper device selection of patients. You know, we traditionally have been using for primary prevention uh, the ejection fraction is an arbitrator below 35% or 30% as an indication for primary prevention for institution of CRT or ICD therapy. This study came out in Jack Imaging last year from the investigators uh, by Dr. Abrogada Gaudi CRT. It was not a randomized trial, but nonetheless, what they did was they took patients 235 for primary prevention for getting CRT. And then they decided, well, should we do CRTP, just pacing, or CRTD with the defibrillator? You could say, well, it's just a ladder. No, it's not a ladder. It's actually a substantial cost, a substantial burden for the patient. It's a much heavier device. <laughs> lower battery longevity, and perhaps a device that might not be ever used and might lead to other complications, also tricuspid regurgitation and many other things. These patients had cardiac MRI up front with late gadolinium enhancement, and then some of them received CRP and some of them received CRTD. Majority received CRTD. As I said, this was not blinded. This was um, not uh, stratified or randomized. And what they did was, and I would encourage you to take a look at the paper, which I would not have the chance to go through in more details, they look at not only the scar quantification, burden, and transmurality, but they also did a very sophisticated analysis in these channels, in these border zone channels. It, this is what is called the gray zone, and these are the areas of vulnerability of reentry tachycardias. And they looked at it and saw that if patients had a scar burden that was less than 10 milligrams, they had a very good negative predictive value of ever having to use that ICD for therapy. So less scar means likelihood of less VTs abnormalities. Then they went next, do they have channels? And if they had no channels, excellent, also prognosis, despite having low ejection fraction. And then, you know, for those that had channels and had high burden of scar, then those were the patients that could be potentially the ones that we should consider the indication for therapies. These are just a couple of slides that were sitting there in the plenary taking pictures. As you can see, the slides are a little bit, but some studies that were presented, very thought provoking. They are now in uh, preparation of this manuscript using CMR, late gadolinium enhancement, as the arbitrator. Should you get CRTP or CRTD? They're talking about a cost savings of more than 70,000, 70 million euros if you use that instead of using just regular ejection fraction. And as you can see here in a couple of examples, they show ejection fraction. Both of these patients have low ejection fraction 12 months after CRT improved. This patient did not improve, had no response, but you can see this patient had scar. And despite the EF improvement, it was the scar that dictated the outcomes. In patients that had no scar, no late gadolinium enhancement, they had no, absolutely no firing from this CRTD. 
So perhaps we might be a little bit uh, thinking about when to choose these device therapies and use that opportunity to learn more. Let me skip for the next topic, which would be now switching from coronary artery disease and SCAR to now a different process. Heart failure also comes with preserved ejection fraction. So this is a 57-year-old male admitted with progressive exertional dyspnea, fatigue, and low energy, no significant cardiac history. He had been treated for an upper respiratory infection with amoxicillin, and two days prior to admission to the emergency room, he had PND and orthopnea. He had no anginal symptoms. He returned to the PCP, and the PCP then, after having given him amoxicillin without improvement, decided to check a troponin. The troponin was borderline mildly elevated. He went sent for the uh, emergency room. As you can see, his blood pressure was elevated. He was tachycardic. His BNP was also elevated. Chest x-ray, maybe some cephalization, more pruning on the, the hilum here. But EKG, otherwise, not significant findings here, maybe poor R wave progression, but no significant ST or T wave changes indicative of ischemia. These are the transthoracic echocardiographic images. And based on the lecture from Dr. Nagre, how would you guys define this diastolic function? Grade one, any takers? Grade two? Grade three? Two. Okay. I do not. Um, a point here, what was the S, the E prime, it, it probably can see it's less than five. And he's tachycardic, it's gonna be probably around the three-ish or so. But you can see that even with the Valsalva, you know, you can still have a very high EA ratio. So kind of great to with. So, but importantly, ejection fraction is preserved. There is increased wall thickness, not only of the left, but also on the right side, right? So when we go back and talk to him, and this is the global longitudinal strain pattern. Okay, so keep that in mind. When we talk to him a little bit more, then we realize that actually he had been previously hypertensive, but now he had been normal tensive, and you know, one of the things was that they were taking off him some antihypertensives. We look at the cardiac MRI, and one can see that he has cardiac amyloidosis, which is you know, a, a diagnosis suspected based on the findings on both the diastolic and echocardiographic findings and strain. This is a, an example of a completely normal myocardium patient, with, in his case here, diffusely infiltrative cardiomyopathy, uh, pericardial effusion, and so on. <clears throat> Had biopsy done, which was positive for amyloid. He got chemotherapy as well as bone marrow transplant, and has been doing actually quite well. So primary AL amyloidosis, which is something to be suspected uh, in these individuals at a slightly younger age. This is a cardiomyopathy that is quite toxic. Uh, there is some uh, animal studies and some basic science studies showing that the pair protein can actually cause some cell um, toxicity to the myocytes. The cardiac involvement is very common. This is thought to be rare, but they actually the one that is really uh, just rampant that we are just about to now start to see more and more, and we're seeing that more, is the senile cardiac amyloidosis, or wild type transthyretin. Uh, which comes with aging. And um, we'll be talking a little bit more there about that tomorrow. But cardiac MR can be helpful uh, in terms of identifying the pattern of gadolinium enhancement. And it seems that the pattern, if it is subendocardial, not yet transmural, provides a better survivorship of these patients. And it seems that extracellular volume fraction might be also another important marker, a marker of diffuse infiltration fibrosis that we'll be able to track over time and even response to therapies. This is an area of very rapid uh, development. There are a lot of phase two and three trials now for medications that are gonna be able to not only stabilize the transthyretin protein, but even silence the mRNA and be doing that, being able to harvest it from the liver and potentially from the heart. So in conclusion, uh, cardiac MRI in this situation here, oops, Cardiac MRI for ischemic heart disease and for heart failure has provided an immense opportunity for us to learn better from revascularization and device selection. And I believe for particularly HFPF, this field of microvascular disease and also evaluation of other concomitant infiltrative cardiomyopathies could be quite helpful. And with that, I'd like to finish, and thank you very much.